Praise God. If you got your Bible, grab your Bible. Let's stand to our feet. Let's close it out this year with our confession. Come on, hold it up high. Wherever your Bible is, in your phone or in your hand, hold it up high and say it with me. I believe the Bible was written. I can't hear y'all. Say it again. I believe the Bible was written and preserved over thousands of years for me. It is relevant for me and it is intended for me. I believe I can do everything it says I can do. I believe I am everything it says I am. It is now time for me to receive the anointing, preaching, and teaching of God's Word. I will listen. Now, this is key. Stop for a minute. This is key, what you're about to say. Don't just read the screen. Listen to what you're saying. Now, let's say it. I will listen. I will retain, and I will allow the Word of God to change me and make me into the person God desires for me to be. I am a leader. I will take notes. Because all great leaders take notes. You can be seated. Take that worship guide, first things first, and flip it over. Are you a giver? Are you a giver? I'm not talking about you consider yourself a giver and a giving person. Do you actually give? Oh, yeah, I'm a giver. I'm a giver. I'm going to be blunt with you, okay, today. How many, you know, some of y'all are first time visitors, so I don't know if I'm your pastor yet, but if you're in this house and I'm your pastor, shout amen. Well, that's a pretty good enough crowd for me to just go ahead and tell it like it is then. Here's the reality the blessings of God and the favor of God reside upon givers. Mm. He loves a cheerful giver. Some people think, <clears throat> you have to excuse me, I've got this thing going on in my throat. I declare in the name of Jesus, it's gone. But I will probably eat several of these pieces of what I think is really candy, but they call them halls. But the devil is a lie. See, some people mistakenly think that if they are a believer, and if their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, that the favor of God is upon them. Now listen to me. The favor of God, unmerited favor called grace is upon every believer. Grace, forgiveness of sins is upon every believer. But I'm talking about bless going in and bless coming out. I'm talking about the head and not the tail. I'm talking about above and not beneath. 30, 60, 100 fold. I'm talking about my cup is running over. Oh, y'all ain't hearing me. I ain't talking about having enough. I'm talking about having more than enough. Can I go ahead and say something before I get in my sermon today? I don't need your permission. I'm going to do it anyway, but it makes me feel good when you say amen. The most selfish prayer you could ever pray is, Lord, I'm asking you to just give me what I need. You know my needs, Lord. All I'm asking you is to meet my needs. That is the biggest lie that the devil has ever convinced the church to believe. Because here's why it's a selfish prayer. Because if God answers, he's going to answer your prayer, by the way, most of the time, the way you pray it. And if you pray, God, all I want is for you to meet my needs. What you are saying to God is, all I care about is myself. Because if all you have is what you need, you can't sow into the children of Uganda. I wish I had some people to help me this morning. You need to be blessed. You need to understand the power of the favor of God. We're in a world where it seems like families, marriages, and this nation is being torn apart and crumbling. Can I tell you something? That the problem is we are, we are not givers. I'm not talking about just financially. Oh, yeah, I am talking about that. But I'm talking about giving of yourself. The reason marriages are falling apart is because one spouse 
All they want is what they need out of the other one. Am I preaching right? But didn't God's word say, whatever you need, you're supposed to sow? Hallelujah. If you want your wife or your husband to be kinder to you, then you probably need to sow and give away kindness. For whatever you sow, that shall you also but you expected to reap something that you ain't willing to sow. We got it backwards. We tell God we'll give once we get. When things get better, I promise you, Lord, I'm going to give. But God said, that's not a cheerful giver. A cheerful giver says, you know what the word cheerful giver, what the word cheerful means? It means hilarious. It literally means in the original language, hilarious giver. Not just a happy giver, a, a, a giver that's, you know, a little bit crazy. <laughs> Come on. I'm talking about some, some type of giving that you'll be like, um, okay. This is insane. What am I doing? And you have to laugh to keep from crying. Woo, I'm going to do it. God, I'm going to lose everything if you don't show up. I'm almost through with my introduction. I'm convinced that divorce, crime, poverty, most every issue that politicians are trying to convince you that if you elect them, They'll fix, which they've been saying for over a hundred years, and nobody's been able to fix it. I'm convinced that every one of those problems are tied to giving. Mm -hmm. See, I think I just need to stop right now and pray for y'all because some of y'all already offended at me. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I, d I break every religious spirit right now. I bind every devil in hell right now that would try to cause their mind to get offended and get upset with what I'm saying. Let their minds be open. Let their hearts be open. It might shock you to know that Jesus talked more about money than he did any other subject, including heaven and hell. What? Money and possessions he talked more about than any other subject in his three and a half years here. It was Jesus that told us that in, and we'll read it from the New Living Translation, Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters. For you will hate the one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God, both God and money. So he made it very clear. You can't serve God and you, at, at the same time you're serving and are a slave to money. One translation says, <clears throat> you can't serve God and the bank. That's a message. The message says you can't serve God and the bank. Some of y'all serve the bank more than you serve God. You wouldn't dare miss a house payment. If you do, you're freaking out about it. Now you're two months behind. You get three months behind. And you might lose your house. So you start moving heaven and earth, calling people, asking people for money, all this kind of stuff, because whatever reason happened that got you to that place, you're freaking out about what's going to happen, what the bank is going to do. But you ain't worried about the fact that you're about 20 years behind on God. I hope all our first-time visitors come back. I promise you, I'm not one of them. You can ask anybody that attends here. I don't preach on money that much. Once or twice a year, I'll talk about it. 
But this is the end of the year. We need to understand where we're going. See, one of the principles that I want to talk to you today about is called first fruits. Everybody say first fruits. I'm going to get in trouble. See, there's a reason why I got gloves, gloves up here. Because I got a pan of chocolate chip cookie dough. Yes, I do. I need some better gloves. Y'all going to eat it raw? Ain't that, ain't that dangerous? It's delicious? Okay. Now, what I want to show y'all is something that I want to illustrate something to you that if you'll let the Lord teach you something today, your life will forever be changed. Y'all see all that cookie dough? Oh, yeah. I can really eat this raw. All right. It's Pillsbury. This is good stuff. All right. I have. I was trying to act holy, but I have ate it before. Now, you've got to understand something. First fruits is a principle that we've been walking in in this church since we were in the hay barn. In about 2000, I mean, excuse me, about 1997, I think is when I first taught this. The, the earth was built and the principles of everything in our life is built upon sowing and reaping. Genesis teaches us that there's a famous story of Cain and Abel. The Bible says that Cain brought an offering, listen, but Abel brought the firstborn. See, when you study it out, you'll find out that Cain just grabbed something out of the field. But Abel brought the first. There's a principle in the word of God of favor on the first. In fact, it's a principle of Old Testament that when the, when the man of God was going to bless his children, he would lay his hands upon his firstborn. Are y'all with me? God wants to bless us. We are, he is our father and we are his children. He wants to bless us. He wants, us to lay, he wants to lay hands on us as the firstborn. There's nothing wrong with believing that God wants to bless us. In fact, I think some of y'all need to tear the devil up by just opening your mouth. You ain't said it in forever. And just open your mouth and repeat after me. God desires to bless me. Some of y'all were afraid to say it because you've been so fed the lie by the modern church and people are so afraid because of other people who have taken advantage of this message, abused this message, you're now against any kind of talking about being blessed by God. I am not a prosperity gospel preacher in the sense that everybody is filled under that umbrella. I believe in prosperity, but I don't believe God blessed me so that I can have a shinier car than you. I don't believe God wants to bless me so that I can have a, a nicer home than you. I believe God blessed me just like he told Abraham, you, will, you are going to be blessed and you will be a blessing. I can't even hardly talk up here, y'all, and y'all won't even shout amen. I'm screaming my guts out. Listen to me. Listen. You are blessed to be a blessing. God wants to bless us. He died so that he could bless us. Yes, he, desired, he died to give us salvation, but he died to give us so much more. John 10.10 10 says the thief comes but to steal, to kill and destroy. What's the first thing he does? Steal. What happens when you steal? You take something from someone else that doesn't belong to you. In other words, he comes to steal and take away your possessions. He comes to kill you physically and he comes to destroy everything in your life. 
Jesus said, but I am the opposite. I come to give you life and that you have it more abundantly. Oh, y'all ain't hearing me. Ain't that what scripture says? I like what the Amplified Bible says. Jesus said, I came that they may have life. Watch this. And enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. See, the best way I can describe favor to you is this. How many's got kids? Raise your hand if you got kids. I don't care how old they are. You ever had? All right, if you've got kids, no matter how old they are, they all started out as a baby. And it was the cutest thing in the world. And you thought it was the cutest thing in the world when you saw them crawling. Y'all, look, look, he's crawling. Next thing you know, he's pulling up, she's pulling up. Oh, my goodness, get the camera. Cutest thing in the world. And then they take those first steps. Yo, my goodness, it goes viral. Everybody sees it on Instagram. It's the cutest thing in the world. And then they become little tyrants running all over the house, pulling things down, climbing up on curtains, jerking things down. And then one day they get in the refrigerator and they saw you so many times opening the milk jug. They, op they learned how to open the milk jug. And, and how many knows it was really loud. Then all of a sudden it got quiet. And how many knows when it gets quiet, you better be looking because something is going down. And you start looking for your precious, beautiful baby. And you go into, watch this, the kitchen. And there stands your, or sits your precious child in the floor just pouring milk out all over the floor and all over their body. It's just everywhere. Now watch this. Our first reaction is, this is the way I was taught. Boy, I'm going to tear you up wasting that milk like that. Do you know how much a gallon of milk costs? But to the child, they don't understand the cost. And quite frankly, they don't care about the cost. Because at that moment, waste is furthest thing from their mind. They're enjoying life. See, what we call waste, God calls favor. We think people can have too much. We get jealous when somebody has too much. But it ain't up to you to decide what too much is. But you got a whole group of people out there trying to tell you that they know how much too much is. Well, it's 1108 if you're taking a pill. I done took one this morning. Sinus pill. I called it the gospel. I said, I'm taking this sinus pill and I'm taking the gospel at the same time, Lord. Use this and heal me in the name of Jesus. I'm going to fumigate this microphone after today. See, here's the problem. We think we have a provision problem, but we don't have a provision problem. We have a revelation problem. We think we don't have enough resources to do what God has called us to do, but what we really don't have is revelation of what it takes to get what we need to do what God has called us to do. We want God to take care of it, but we don't want to do what God told us to do. Well, mm -hmm. see, when it comes to first fruits, most people believe that the tithe is the first fruit. It's completely false. In fact, first fruits, tithe, and offerings are three distinct things from God. Listen to what the Bible says in Nehemiah chapter 12, verse 44. And at the same time, let's talk about the, the temple, the priests. At the same time, some were appointed over the rooms. Somebody say rooms. How many knows that S means plural? Not room, rooms of the storehouse. 
We know from Malachi chapter 3, the storehouse is the house of God. Rooms of the storehouse, the house of God, the temple. For the offerings, comma. For the first fruits, comma. And the tithes, comma. To gather into them from the fields of the cities the portions specified by the law for the priests and Levites. For Judah rejoiced over the priests and the Levites who ministered. Very quickly, let me give you, let me give you a lesson. Do you know what the word tithe means? Ten. Everybody say ten. It means ten percent. Tithe does not mean eight percent. Tithe does not mean five percent. Tithe does not mean if I got a 20, I'm going to give it. Tithe does not mean all I got is a five, so I'm going to tithe this five. Tithe means 10. I'm not preaching anything that's not true. That's very simple to understand. That's what the word tithe means. Some of y'all think that those envelopes have supernatural magical power that as long as you put it in a tithing envelope, you've now tithed. You haven't tithed if what's in that envelope is not 10%. Oh, do y'all still love you, pastor? Mm, my God, I thought I'd get more love than that. Well, bless God, you know, they saw you drop it in the bucket, so therefore you feel better about yourself. But here's how silly that is. Don't you know God knows what 10% is in your house? So I'm not preaching on tithing today, but I just needed to be clear that you understood that tithing, if you are a tither, means 10% of what comes into your house. And for those that are wondering, it's up to you. It doesn't spell it out correctly, but here's how I've always led my life. I don't tithe on after the taxes is taken out. I tithe on what I made before the taxes was taken out. Because here's the, here, oh, I know what you're saying. Some of y'all are going to be like, yeah, but I tithe on my income tax return when I get it to the end of the year. Well, praise God for that. Here's the problem with that, though. If you get a refund check, that refund check only is an amount that you paid above what was required of you to give to the government. So there's an entire number, who knows what that number is, that nothing was tithed on. You gave 100% of it to, to the government, and you never tithed on it. You only tithed on what you were left with after you gave the government 100% of what they demanded. So the best thing to do is tithe on what somebody gives me a 20 or uh, gives me a $10 bill, I'm going to tithe the dollar. I'm not going to cut the taxes out of it and then tithe whatever it is, 80 cents. I mean 90 cents. By God, I went to Warrior. I love my school. Now watch this. An offering is simply defined as this. Anything you give financially, listen to me, above your tithe. Because an obedient giver, before they do anything, they tithe. They don't start with offering. They start with tithe. Well, y'all was shutting me down when I was talking about cookie dough. Now watch this. An offering is what you give, even if it's a dollar, even if it's a quarter. It's above what you tithe. Your offering is a seed. Your tithe is not a seed. Your tithe doesn't belong to you. So you're not sowing 10%. You are giving in the offering your seed. Mm. I'm going to help some of y'all if y'all let me help. But first fruits is completely different from that. Romans eleven sixteen. 16. I love that this is in the New Testament because people are like, oh, it's all in the Old Testament. Watch what the New Testament says in Romans eleven sixteen. 16. It says, for if the first fruit is holy... The lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. In other words, some of y'all need to write this down. What you do with the first will affect the rest. 
What you do with the first will affect the rest. See, here's the reality. The Bible says the tithe is holy and belongs to God. It's his. That's why Malachi chapter 3 says, Will a man rob God? How have we robbed you, Lord? He says, You have robbed me in tithe and offering. But if you'll bring me all the tithes and offers into the storehouse and prove me now, check me up on this, and see if I'll not pour you out blessings from the windows of heaven that you don't have room to receive. He says, what opens the doors is you being obedient and bringing back to me what already belongs to me. How many knows the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof? That's what the Bible says. So in other words, it's all his. He could demand all of it. But he said, I'm going to try to show you a principle of discipline, of discipleship. I can show you how you can live better on 90% than you can on 100. Now, if you're a tither, let's just go ahead and do it. If you're a tither in here, say amen. amen. Sounds like a lot of tithers, praise God. But here's the thing about tithing. The 10% is holy unto God. There's no doubt about it. The Bible says when you bring it back to him, you declare that this is holy and it is not for me to keep. In other words, I'm robbing from you, God. I'm holding something that I'm not holy. You are holy. This belongs to you. You, I'm bringing it back to you. So so we're living under a blessing of 10% of our money being holy. But God wants... 100% of everything we are blessed with to be holy. How then, the Bible says, if a man cannot be faithful with the unrighteous money, how then shall he partake in the true riches of God? God says you'll either serve God or you'll serve money. The Bible does not say money is the root of all evil. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. Are you with me, church? So he lays it out very clearly that what is left after the 10% is cursed like everything else. And you got to work by the sweat of your brow and it is not holy. But I'm going to show you something without making you think I'm trying my best not to make you think I'm manipulating you because I'm not manipulating you. And it's really quite frank. I started to say I could care less, but that's not true. I care. I want to see you blessed. But it ain't going to change the way I feel about you. And nobody's going to make you do any of this. This is between you and God. But I'm trying to help you. I want to show you that God has a principle in the word of God that does something significant to to the remaining 90%. And that is first fruits. If the first is holy, then the lump is holy. So now, this is why I brought this. Because I, I want you to never forget this. Right now, there is a glorious Holy Ghost mound of chocolate chip cookie dough. Now, if anybody wants this afterwards, you can have it because I ain't touched it with my bare hands. Trust me. I have sneezed over it and coughed over it, by the way, <laughs> I think. But where's your faith at? <laughs> now, watch this. Can, yeah, true. Can, can most people see this? Can y'all see the lump? Everybody? Okay. Now, watch this. I'm going to take out a chunk. I want to show you the power of first fruits. Now, this is separate from all of that. That represents everything the Lord is going to bless you with in 2020. Everything. This represents you participating in first fruits. So you pulled out in advance by faith, declaring everything my hands touch in 2020 is going to be blessed beyond measure. So I'm going to give you the first fruits in the first month. Now, 
Paul said in Romans, we just read it, if the first is holy, then the lump is holy. Now understand, this is not the first 10%. That's already holy. That's the tithe that belongs to God. This is, represents the first full blessing from God. That's what first fruits is. It's the first 100% of something. It's you by faith saying, I'm not just going to tithe on this first. I'm going to give it all to you, God. Now, some people over time have first fruited at one day's wage. They've looked at whatever they would get paid for one day, and they sold it. A lot of people in this church, it may surprise you, many times there are people that are very low income, but high faith. Believe in God that their life's going to change over the years. Have planned in advance to sow an entire week's salary. Some of you would think, well, if I lost one week, I'd lose everything. We need to change the way we think then. God doesn't want you living a life where if you missed one week's work, you would lose your house, your car, and you'd be on the street. That's not the abundant life. Can I get an amen? Is this microphone working? Can I get somebody to help me? I've seen them so. I remember one particular lady. She lost her job after years of working at this place. Out of nowhere lost her job in November. By the end of December, she was still struggling to get on unemployment. Because of issues, she had nothing. The first Sunday in January, she first fruited everything she had. Everything she had, she gave it to God and said, God, I have nothing left to give, so I'll give you everything I got. Within a matter of a couple of weeks, she had the best job she'd ever had. She never missed a bill. God blessed her beyond measure because she trusted God even when it made no sense to trust God. Come on, give the Lord a praise right now. See, listen, Proverbs 3, 9 through 10 says this. Watch this. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruit of all your increase. So your barns may be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Now, here's what you got to get. Notice that it says, honor the Lord with whose possessions? Yours possessions. Now watch this. That tells me that first fruit cannot be tithe. Because the 10% is not mine. I have no rights to it. So if, if I just tithe, which is a great thing to be a tither, you can't understand the process of first fruits because all you're doing is returning to a possession to someone who already claims ownership over it. That's God. So the way you honor the Lord with your possessions is you have to honor him with what God has given you right to call yours. Which is involved in the 90% that's left. Now watch what he says. Honor the Lord with your possessions. That's a part of that 90%. And with the first fruit of all your increase. You got to understand when this was written, this was talking about harvest time. This was talking about when the first harvest would come in, the first time they would go out and harvest the wheat, they would take that first harvest of wheat and they would bring it to the house of God and they would give all of the harvest of wheat or the firstborn lamb or the, or the first of whatever their occupation was, they would bring it to the house of God. Why? So that the poor could be taken care of so that the house of God could be taken care of so that when people needed food the storehouse had what they needed to be able to, to take care of the needs of the people is it any wonder why the world is in such poverty it is because somewhere along the line we forgot that it's not the government's job to take care of the poor it is supposed to be the church's job to take care of the poor but most churches can barely can even keep the lights on let alone take care of the poor they're trying to equip the saints for the work of the ministry and the pastor's up there under so much stress because he's believing God that they're going to be able to keep the doors open another week. Yeah. 
So it's the first sale. It's the first check. It's the first anything. But it's totally optional. Now, tithes and offerings are not optional. Certainly, tithes is not optional. Tithes are not optional. Okay? For a believer, a believer should be a tither and a giver. But now watch this. As long as I keep this out here, I got one or two things I can do. I can do something with this. Because remember, in, in this lump is 100% of something first in my life. Now watch this. In this lump, 10% belongs to God. You with me? The other 90%. I 100% have the right to do with whatever I want to do with it. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm really scared to eat this. Am I okay with eating this? I mean, am I, am I going to die, y'all? If I fall over, will y'all resuscitate me or something? You're off, no, you're always on duty, sister. All right, here we go. See, I'm kidding, okay, y'all? I know I can eat this. What's this? I have the right to consume this. Tastes like a cookie. Or I can sow it by faith back in to the whole year. Now watch this. Listen, pay attention. Watch this. Now, is it even possible for anyone in this church to come up here and put one of these gloves on and pull out what I just put in it? You'll never know where it is, right? Because now it has become a part of the lump. But because it was my first fruit, I sowed it in advance by faith. Remember what he said? By all of the increase that is coming. I declared in 2020, I don't know how much you're going to bless me. I don't know how much is going to come in because I don't know the future. But I sowed my first fruits into this year by faith. And I put it back in with the whole lump. And now where. Inside that lump for the entire year, 10% of it is holy and 90% of it is not. When I sow first fruits, if the lump is holy, if the, if the first is holy, the lump becomes holy. So now God supernaturally gives us a way to operate not on 10% of our money and our finances and our giving being holy but 100%. Even though we hold on to it and keep it, God can do more with even the 90% now because we declared in first fruits that the lump is holy. Are you with me, church? Now listen to this, and I'm coming down off this mountain. Leviticus 23, verses 10 through 14 says this, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when you come into the land which I give you and reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. He shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted on your behalf. And on the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And you shall offer on that day when you have the sheaf a male lamb of the first year without blemish as a burnt offering to the Lord. Its grain offering shall be two tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil, an offering made by fire to the Lord for a sweet aroma. And its drink offering shall be of wine, one-fourth of a hen. Now watch this. Verse 14. This is huge. Now I know this is in the Old Testament. That's why I'm talking about this is optional. But remember, God, Jesus said he didn't come to destroy the law, but rather fulfill the law. So just because he is, we have a new covenant don't mean we cannot learn and operate under principles of the Old Testament. Watch what he says. Verse 14. For you shall eat neither bread, nor parched grain, nor fresh grain until the same day that you have brought an offering or the first fruit. That's what you see. That's what we're talking about. To your God. 
Now watch this. It shall be a statue forever throughout your generations and in all your dwellings. Now we know this is a statement to the Jewish people. We most for, most for the most part in here, we are Gentiles. There may be some Messianic Jews in here, but most of us are Gentiles. We're in a new covenant. But let's not forget that God says when we're born again, we are grafted into the vine. We become part of his chosen people. So we see that this is a statute, not a command, but a principle that is in place for all generations. Now, the key thing is you got to get this. This is how they believed in this so much back then. He said, you and your family will not eat one single thing until you have done this. They taught their children when they were hungry, I'm going to feed you. But in this house, we don't consume anything. Until we've blessed God. Until we've blessed his house. Until we have sown. When we have sown, then we eat. Now don't twist my words and go home and say, bless God. We ain't going to eat nothing tomorrow because I ain't got no offering to give. Feed your kids. Okay, don't blame me. Don't have no, mama won't feed me no more because of what you said. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying, some of y'all will pay Alabama power, charter cable. If some of y'all didn't have internet in your house or on your smartphone, you would literally ask God, even so, Lord, come quickly. I'm suffering for you, Jesus. Rapture me out. You'll make sure all that's paid. In fact, even though on our website you can set up auto pay for your tithe, you ain't never did it, but you got auto pay set up for your cell phone, for your internet, for your house payment. You'll say stuff like this, well, I'd just rather go ahead and let it get drawn out. Because if I ain't got it, I ain't got to worry about it. It's just come on out. But when it comes to God, I can't do that because what happens if my tithe comes out and I had a down week and now Verizon comes out after my tithe. Now I got to bounce check. Now I got to pay for all these fees. Ain't God's fault. It ain't God's fault. You only hear this one time a year. That's it. But I thought that's powerful when he says, you shall not eat bread nor grain nor anything until you have brought your offering to God. You know what that tells me? That's a culture of understanding in families of giving. We have so abused the grace of God. You say, well, I can't, how could we abuse, you can't abuse the grace of God. I understand where you're coming from because it's unmerited, it's undeserved. So there's nothing you can do to earn it. But here's what we've done in the modern church. We have taken the teaching of grace and so applied it to every principle of our life that we now condone rebellious behavior Because God understands because he paid the price for me and there is therefore no condemnation of them which are in Christ Jesus. We know all those scriptures that we can quote. Hmm? And I believe that. I'm not preaching condemnation. I just got through telling you. Can I just be blunt with you? I just got through telling you. It don't matter to me whether you do this or not. or not. That's up to you. It's up to you whether you want to be in obedience to God or not. I can't make you be obedient. So you're talking about there's three three rooms in the storehouse. Tithe, 
offerings and first fruits. If you've ever given in first fruits offerings before in your life, stand to your feet right now. If you've ever given first fruits, stand to your feet. Now, of all those that are standing, how many would raise your hand? I'm not trying to just pump up my sermon. But how many of you would say that when I sowed what I sowed, financially and in my family, it made no sense for me to do that. In fact, it was the opposite. It scared me because I didn't know how I was going to do it. Raise your hand. I want you to see the hands. See the hands? Okay. Now, of those that just raised your hands, put your hands down. Of those that just raised your hands, did God do something for you supernaturally as a result, whether it's blessing your business, blessing your family, doing something for you in that year that blew your mind or specifically what you sowed your first fruits for, it actually happened. Raise your hand. My God, look at this. Look at this. Give God the praise right now. Watch this. I'm talking about. Y'all can be seated. Now watch this. 90%, 90% of the people that stood, 90% of the people that stood at least raised their hands and said it made no sense for me to do it. In fact, it, it was, I was nervous to do it. I didn't know how God was going to do it, but I was obedient to God. 100% of those that stood up raised their hands and said God did a miracle that blew their mind or specifically the thing that they had prayed for. It's a supernatural thing, y'all. It doesn't make sense in the natural. It's a supernatural thing. It's just like prayer. Let's, let's be real. Can I just be open and honest with y'all? Prayer to the natural person, not the believer, is really silly. To those that don't understand what prayer is, it really is silly. Because this is what it looks like. You're talking with your mouth to the air to a God you cannot see and you cannot hear an audible voice booming or he's not sitting down right across from you at the kitchen table and you're asking him a question and he goes, okay, I got what you're saying. Give me a pen and paper. Let me mark, that. Let me mark this out. Let me show you how it's all going to work out. No, by faith, we speak words, trusting. Do you believe in prayer? Say amen. amen. Trusting that the God we serve hears our prayers. Amen. Come on. The answers of the Lord are yes and amen. You can't answer somebody if you didn't hear them ask a question. But most believers don't ever say, well, I wish that, I wish that pastor stopped preaching about prayer. That's the silliest thing I ever heard in my life. He's telling me, he said the word of God says that we can call unto the Lord and he will answer us and show us great and mighty things that we know not. Really? Huh? How many believes in prayer? Do you pray for your kids? Why? Because you believe that God somehow supernaturally in the invisible world makes no sense, takes your words in the atmosphere and transforms them into something that makes its way all the way to the throne of God. And God says, oh yes, I hear you. The answers of the Lord are yes and amen. I I'll heal your baby. I'll deliver them. We have no trouble believing that God somehow, because let's, let's talk about real natural things here. We don't know where the planet heaven is, but it's probably way beyond our galaxy. But we believe our prayers. Here's how crazy the world thinks we are. I believe, whether you believe it or not, I don't even care. I know what I believe. 
I believe that right now when I say, Jesus, I love you. I surrender my life to you. Forgive me of my sins and come into my heart. There is no delay. It doesn't take hours to get to him, years to get to him. It is instant. He says, I forgive you. Put his name in the book. But yet, y'all knew I was setting you up. But yet, it's hard for us to believe that God could take something that is placed in a bucket or sit online or text or put in an envelope and give to God. It's hard for us to believe that God can take that gift and not only honor that gift, but take care of all the other things that you were worried about supernaturally. It's just like the people that will believe God that God will save them but doesn't believe in healing anymore. That healing is no longer for the church. Well, why? I want to know that. Why? Because the same thing that I do to ask Jesus to forgive me is the same thing I do when I ask him to heal me. So who died and gave you the right to tell me what makes it to God and what does it? But you know what we'll do? We'll shout the preacher down when he preaches on we need to preach salvation. We'll shout the preacher down when we talk about, here's the, here's the irony of it. We'll shout the preacher down when the preacher talks about we need to take care of the poor. But we won't give anything to help take care of the poor. We get excited when we see pictures that on the other side of the world in the continent of Africa, 200 people were born again and children who would have never had a Christmas was able to have a Christmas. And we're excited that Solid Rock Church made that happen. But can I be real with you? Some of y'all were sitting there feeling bad because you didn't give a single thing. I'm not trying to beat you up. I'm just trying to say, you got to ask yourself why not. you got to ask yourself, why is it that you'll drive, spend money, buy tickets to a football game, drive hours to it, spend ungodly amounts of food, on money on food, go in there, spend on who knows how much money. When you know you don't have that money. Oh, but this is a once in a lifetime thing, man. This is, they're playing in a game I might not ever see again. Do you hear yourself? Because every day you breathe, every day you wake up is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Who knows if you've got one tomorrow? Who knows? You may not make it to tomorrow. So you, you better make good of the day you're in. When you stand before God, He's going to separate you from sheep and goats. You know why he says sheep and goats? Because sheep just say, man, and follow. Goats, buckheads. You better not be a part of the goats because the goats are like this. I would give the Lord, I would give to the Lord butt. Button heads, button heads. But if I had more money, but if I had a better job, but if I didn't do this, but some of y'all got your butt so big you can't even get in the. The church got a big old butt. Oh, yeah. Church got a big old butt. The Lord said, I don't like big butts. Sorry. You need to get rid of your butt. Get on the side of the lamb. Trade your butt in for back. Because here's what happens when they're separated. I was hungry. That's what he said. And you fed me. I was in prison and you visited me. 
I was in the hospital and you prayed for me. I was naked and you clothed me. One side's going to say, when, Lord? When? We would have certainly took care of you. And the Lord's going to say to the sheep, you fed me, you took care of me, because when you did it unto the least of these, you done it unto me. He's going to look at the goats and he's going to say, but you didn't do it unto the least of these, so you didn't do it unto me. Are you a giver? Man, go into 2020 seeing clearly. Look at that TV and see what that TV really is to you. Is it taking too much of your time? Are you getting fed stuff from the world that you don't need to be listening to? Forget the TV. Because some of y'all feel so holy because you oh, I don't even hardly watch TV. You know why you don't watch TV? Because you look at this all the time. That's the only reason you don't watch TV. Your TV just shrunk down. In fact, it's worse because now it's in your hand and now you can look at stuff that nobody else in your family knows you're looking at. Used to, you had to deal with your mess between you and God and your family. Now, before you ever even talk to your family, you gotta get online and post about your frustrations and bring total strangers into the mess that God wanted to try to deal with for you, but now you can't deal with it because you done told the whole world about your mess. And when the preacher preaches a message like this, you get on Facebook and you don't say, well, my pastor preached something I didn't like. You've learned how to store a veiled reference. But what you're doing is saying, I don't want to accept what God's word says. I'm closing. I got clarity, y'all. I know who I am in God. I, I know what God's called me to do. If you can't handle once a year, once a year, your pastor who you called your spiritual father not telling you the truth about God's word on finances, if you can't handle that, you want the truth, you can't handle the truth. Some of y'all just that was zooming right over y'all's head. Younger generation. Younger, they too young. They don't even know what I'm talking about. I got to get some new material, David. Man, I'm telling you right now. My wife and I got married in 1989. May of 1989. And I'm not saying this to brag. I'm saying this to tell you what God has done in my life against all odds. I mean, poster boy for having nothing in his life. No education. Barely made it through high school. I mean, barely. I was second from the bottom of my class. I'm not proud of that. I'm just trying to declare, declare you. People brag about it. I was second from the top of my class. I was second from the bottom. Only one other guy had a lower grade than me. And the only way I graduated is my teachers had favor on me and let me come into their classes during study hall and gave me extra points. That's how lazy, that's how rejected, that I wasn't stupid or dumb. I didn't apply myself. I believed I was nothing and I was doing everything in my life to, to fulfill everything that had been spoken over me by the people that should have been speaking life into me. I was determined I was going to fulfill what they said. I was a bum. I was worthless. I was never going to have nothing. And if it wasn't for the teachers just wanting to get rid of me, I wouldn't even graduate. No college. No education. No seminary, no Bible college, nothing. I'm bragging on Jesus here. Standing in a multi-million dollar facility 
Come on, somebody. Touching lives all around the world. Now, I'm going to tell you, I know it's the favor of God, but I'm going to tell you something. In 1989, in a single wide trailer, when we didn't have groceries in our cabinets, me and my wife looked at each other and said, from this point forward, every dollar that comes in this house, we will be obedient to God. If we don't have nothing, we will be givers. And every dollar that's ever come in, we have sown back to God. I'm not bragging, but I'm going to tell you something. You can't even get better credit than I have. It's impossible to even have better credit than I have. I'm not bragging on if you ain't got good credit. I'm just trying to tell you, when I got married, you couldn't get worse credit than I had. We bought a little single wide trailer, not the one I'm talking about, but the first one over in Hayden, Alabama, and I moved in it by myself while we were getting ready to get married. I didn't pay a bill. I didn't know what responsibility was. One day Sandy came over, we was painting. We was painting that little trailer to get ready because we was about two months out from getting married. We was working on this trailer to get it ready. She always would call her mother right before she went home. She goes over there to pick up the phone to call her. No dial tone. She looks at me and says, that's weird. Why is there no dial tone? Did we pull a, a cord out or something somewhere? It, it literally began a snowball two months before we got married. I had to admit to her what a complete fake I was. That's in addition to what you've read about in the book. I had to say, you know what? The phone got turned off because I didn't pay it. What did you do with the money, Larry? What would you do? I trust you to pay. I had no responsibility. I had no understanding. I didn't pay the power bill. I, didn't, I was wasting it on taking her out to eat and all this and making her think. I was still trying to win her, even though she'd agreed to marry me. I was still trying to impress. There was no obedience in my life. I had to come clean and make, admit to her I had nothing. She thought I had decent credit. I had to admit to her it was at that point. Two months before we got married, I had to admit that I that I'd had a truck repossessed. And that they were sending me harassing letters because they if you ever had one repossessed, you know how they do it. They go and they sell it and they get whatever they want to get for it and then they send you a bill for the difference. So they were harassing me, telling me I still owed like $3,000 on a truck that somebody else was driving. Y'all hearing me? It was at the bottom, at the bottom. I'm not exaggerating when I say I think my credit score was about 80. It's like 100 or 80. It's literally as low as it can be. I tried to get a Chevron gas card back when they used to. I mean, you could just literally walk in a store and they'd give you a card in the store back then. They turned me down for a Chevron gas card is how bad my credit was. I had to tell her everything. That was the beginning of all that you've read about in the book. I mean, I come clean and she realized this, is, this will give you even a great appreciation for your, for your first lady. She realized this about your pastor then. This man has nothing. He has nothing to offer me. Everything that she thought she was going to have in a husband, I was none of it. She thought that I was, but I was none of it. Let me tell you what my wife told me. What my wife then, my fiance told me. She said, standing in that little trailer, let me tell you something, Larry Ragland. I'm not going to live this way. I, I remember like it's yesterday. My mom and daddy didn't raise me to live like this. And I'm not living this way. We're getting in the car right now. And we're going to my mom and daddy's house. And you're going to tell my parents everything you just told me because they need to know going in what I'm going into I don't know if I've ever even told this publicly I sit at that kitchen table and I confessed the loser that I was to her parents let me tell you some of my in-laws are two of the greatest human beings that I've ever seen walk the face of this earth they loved me they knew in their spirit, man, they knew that God had sent me to their daughter. But at that point, you can imagine how they felt. They were not happy. 
Sister Elaine, Elder Elaine Motes, grabbed me and touched her, put her hand on my hand, and she said, I got one thing to say to you. Oh, my God, I can remember it like it was yesterday. If you're going to marry my daughter, then you're going to sit there and listen to me teach you about the principle of tithing. I didn't know, I didn't have a clue what tithing was. I've been in church most of my life, never heard nobody teach on it. And sitting there at that kitchen table, her and Durwood laid out what God will do for you when you tithe. And I'll never forget Sister Elaine looking at me and saying, Larry, if you want God to bless, at that time, none of us ever dreamed we'd be preachers and preaching in the gospel. We were just love, in love with each other, wanting to have a job. She said, if you want, if you want God to bless your home, from this day forward, if you want to get out of the mess that you're in and rebuild your life, you've got to put God first in everything you do. So me and my wife looked at each other, my fiance looked at each other, and I said to you, I said to her, I said, I know you ain't got no reason to believe me, but I can tell you this right now, no more lies, no more deception. From this point forward, everything that comes in this house, we will put God first if we have to do without. We got married in May, August of that same year. We became youth pastors. So only part of my life in 30 years of marriage that I hadn't been in the ministry is from May to August of the first year of my marriage, just a few months. I was a youth pastor four months into my marriage. I built that youth group up to 35 kids. A youth pastor for two, two and a half years. In the first year and a half, on Wednesday nights, back then, everybody always went to eat after church. I would always go to Taco Bell. My wife and I didn't even have enough money to go to Taco Bell. I would pull some of the leaders and some of the elders of the church over, and I'd say, can you all take the young people to Taco Bell? They want to go to Taco Bell. Me and Sandy's got something we got to do or something like that because we would go home and make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich because we didn't have enough money to go to Taco Bell. But I can tell you this, we tithed. I worked my tail off. I worked extra overtime. We started trying to pay down debt. One day I come in the kitchen, off from work, walked into the kitchen. Sandy was crying. Just holding the envelope in her hand. She said, do you know what this is? I said, what? She said, this is the first debt. <laughs> I'll be honest with what she said. Your debt. This is the first debt of yours that you brought into this marriage that we've paid off. You know what it was? Let me tell you how silly I was. It was a Sears card. Look how stupid I was. I took out a Sears card because I was going to work out of town at a job in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and it was going to be very cold. I had no good work boots, and I had no coveralls, and I had no gloves. I went to Sears, and I charged a pair of coveralls, a set of gloves, and a pair of boots. That's all I ever put on that charge card. Five years later, I was still paying for those boots because all I ever did was pay the minimum. And I'd pay $10, and the next week they'd say, you don't even have a payment. You owe us zero. And I thought the Lord was blessing me. They were keeping me hooked. She paid off those stinking work boots that probably ended up costing me $2,000 for a pair of cover. But that's, let, me, let me tell you something. Do you know what I did? I paid my bills. I didn't quit on what I committed to do. I decided to be a person of integrity. While other people said, just don't pay for that truck that was repossessed. I said, no, I agreed to do it. And it took us two years. But I paid off somebody else's truck. It was no longer mine. Little by little by little by little. God began to change my life. And then one day we went to buy a car and we were sitting there scared to death. Have you ever been like we were having to go back and forth and finagle and all this kind of stuff, being told, no, your credit's not good enough. So many times we walked away. I'll never forget. And they said, well, I've just ran your credit. You know, we just got to talk about prices because you ain't got no issues. Your credit, your credit's excellent. Me and my wife looked at you and said, oh, my God. What I'm trying to tell you is this. God can do it. <laughs>
God has got you. So many of the pastors that I knew back in then sneered and looked down at me and tried to give me advice on how I was doing it wrong. I'm not saying this to be vindictive. Most of them are not even in the ministry anymore. And now they're asking me what was my secret. How do you get a building like that? How do you get Rod Parsley to come? How do you get Clint Brown to come? How do you get Perry Stone to come? And I have to answer them, I didn't do anything. It's the favor of God. And it is absolutely the favor of God. I know the favor of God is on my life. You need to get to a place where you know the favor of God is on your life. If you don't know that, then do what you got to do to know the favor of God is on your life. Because God is not a man that he should lie. He said, if the first is holy, the lump is holy. If he said, if you give, it shall be given. He said, press down good measure, shaking together, running over. He said, some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. He said, for whatever you sow, that shall all, you also reap. That's what he said. 12 o'clock straight up. How about that? Yeah, I preach for over an hour and I don't care. I'll never forget the day, the last time I preached on, well, the first time I preached on this in the barn. I preached on finances and tithing. And watch this. Five people were born again. How can you have an altar call for people to be born again on this? I'm not having an altar call for you to decide to be a giver. I'm having an altar call right now for you to understand that when you're not giving, you're in disobedience, just like any other thing. Nobody's going to ask you whether you're a giver or a tither. We don't do that here. But I will say this. I'm going to ask everybody to stand. Come on. By the way, I am hoping that everybody can be with us New Year's Eve night. From 9 p.m. to midnight It's one of the most fast-paced, incredible services you'll ever be a part of your life. I believe we've got seven, maybe eight preachers that are going to preach 15 minutes each. And I'm going to say, well, I don't want to come to... It's fun, y'all. I'm telling you, it's fun to see these preachers try to get it out in 15 minutes because that's all they get. I will chase them down. I will take the mic because that's all they get. That's all they get. Oh, I'll catch you. I'll catch you. I'm faster than you think. But uh, New Year's Eve night, 9 p.m., I hope you're going to be here with us. Don't choose to watch the ball drop on your TV at home versus coming to your church with your church family. And certainly don't choose to be drinking alcohol, getting drunk at midnight when you could be drinking the new wine with your church family here. Come on. Think about it. Father, as, as we stand before you, Holy Spirit, begin to convict the people today, God. This is you, Lord. Not condemn the people, but let your Holy Spirit just move upon this house. If you're here today, I'm not, I feel compelled to, to not even ask for a show of hands or even come forward. I feel like right now this is a personal decision between you and God right there where you're at. You, you know if this message has hit home. You know if, if there's other things going on in your life. All over this house, I want us just to say this and mean this in our heart. But especially if this message spoke to you today. You may, you may even be feeling guilt, but that's not what was intended. That's not of God. God is not trying to condemn you. He's just trying to draw you to the truth. Let's all say this together. Father, in the name of your son Jesus, I want to thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for loving me even in my disobedience. Today, Lord, I confess with my mouth that there are some things in my life that I know I should be doing for you, Lord, that I'm not. So I'm asking you to forgive me for that act of disobedience. Give me joy and not guilt as I make a decision from this point forward to be faithful to you and to your word. For I am your child. And I believe you've got me and you've got my family. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Be blessed. Have a great day. Shake somebody's hand. Don't forget to drop those connect cards in as you go. God bless you.